back into the room. Um, uh, the, the more astute of you will notice that I'm not Guy Shockey. Um, he is teaching a course at the moment, and one of the things that I was really keen about when setting this conference up is that we could fail safely. And uh, as a consequence, what we did is we got all of the uh, speakers to record their presentations in case something like this happened or a connection dropped, uh, and as a consequence, we could then play it. So I'm gonna do a bit of an introduction for Guy um, and then and his presentation, and then Tim will uh, roll the video at the time. So Guy Shockey is a full-time uh, Global Underwater Explorers instructor and evaluator who teaches all of GUE's technical diving courses, including both open circuit and closed circuit. He's a former military officer with experience in military aviation and has a graduate degree in political science. He's also one of the first human diver instructors and is passionate about including human factors training in all of his technical dive training. Um, now his talk that he's talked about titled Putting Human Factors into Technical Diving Programs. And he said it's, it's possible to work human factors training into a technical diving class and in such a fashion it's continually reinforced and referenced in nearly all aspects of training. And those who are in the last session with Tim talking about CE and bringing that into the rebreather programs, um, this carries on for this in the practical uh, context. So Tim, if you can roll the video, that would be great. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Guy Shockey, and I am a instructor evaluator for Global Underwater Explorers. And this morning, uh, my time here right now, I'm recording this. I'm going to talk about putting human factors into technical diving programs. I'm recording this in um, uh, sunny Mexico as I'm waiting for an actual technical diving class to start tomorrow morning. And so I'm uh, uh, I hope you don't mind the background. I tried to put the uh, ocean and the uh, waves and everything behind me into it, but it was uh, clearing out the screen. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll get started right away. Uh, the first thing I'd like to mention is that there is really no better opportunity to um, uh, practice human factors and uh, incorporate them into uh, anything other than my experience been with aviation, but a technical dive training is an uh, amazing opportunity to um, in work with human factors. Uh, you're dealing with teams, you're dealing with uh, leaders and, and followers, and you have to worry about communication and situational awareness is the, one of the biggest, biggest things. So that there's just all sorts of opportunity uh, for human factors to be employed. And I'd like to start out by uh, using one of uh, Gareth's diagrams from his human factors um, courses because I think this is key to understanding everything. What we're trying to do as technical divers is we're, a, a good technical diver is just a whole bunch of decisions uh, that are made and uh, they, if they go well, then that's excellent. So we're trying to make good decisions that are affected by things such as situational awareness, uh, communication styles and communication abilities, um, how the teams perform, uh, what the leadership's like, uh, what, what the followers are like, and then this is all affected by um, uh, stress and fatigue or performance shaping factors. So we're going to talk about all of these a little bit later um, inside of a technical diving class. Okay. There are some um, uh, programs that include uh, human factors within them, but they're usually uh, included as a standalone piece of uh, training or, or piece of education. And I, I think that kind of misses some of the benefit that we can get from human factors because it's better if you can thread them through every aspect of the course, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's outside in field drills, whether you're underwater um, in experienced diving or whether you're doing critical skills training and diving, even briefings and debriefings benefit from understanding and employing human factors knowledge so obviously i mean this might go without saying but unfortunately a lot of our instructors um they don't have knowledge of human factors so if you want to uh use it you have to understand the tool yourself and that honestly there's really no better way to do that than than to uh, uh take one of gareth's classes this is like a sales pitch for you gareth but the truth of the matter is there's been a lot of thought and effort mm -hmm. and time go into making this available uh for instructors to understand these concepts and and th this is just the shortest distance between two points right here and uh, that will definitely definitely get you on the way probably it's going to get you more interested uh, in the topic and then uh, who knows where you'll end up right 
when my experience has been even students um, think this way and and then and most instructors is that it's all about technical skills. We're talking about technical diving, so it must be technical skills, right? Gas switches and how to calculate decompression, um, everything uh, that's part and parcel of what makes a technical dive, a traditional technical diving class. But there is very little uh, emphasis on the what we want to call like the softer, softer skills. And I suggest that what you do as an instructor or as a, a future educator is think about how human factors affected your own dive, about how your decision making went when you, um, in your multiple experiences that you've had. And then I think it's very, very important that you need to understand um, what the role of psychological safety, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and also the role that just culture can uh, play within our uh, technical diving communities or just our diving communities in general actually and one of the first things that we need to do is we need to create a uh, a safe environment for uh, us to talk about mistakes and errors and this is this whole concept of psychological safety if you if you look at psychological safety and just culture one is that needs to be present before and the other one is kind of after um, so a psychologically safe environment is is one where it's okay to talk about mistakes and errors um, and then a, a just culture is is what exists uh, so that we don't pass judgment on we try to understand what happened in the situation rather than than just looking for trying to attach blame and and uh, well who's at fault that sort of thing because it's very seldom that anybody intended to make a, a, a significant error or significant mistake so it's more important that we understand the, the context rich story and you'll hear me use those terms um, more often here uh, if we understand what's what was what why did it make sense for that person to make that decision that they did at the time and here's where you can draw on your personal experience because I'm sure we all have, I know I do, I have lots of uh, anecdotes about making mistakes and and if you can share this with uh, with your students, it helps to start to create that psychological um, uh, safety that we're talking about that's so important. What I try to do throughout a whole class is I try to weave tales and uh, actually they're true stories, but <laughs> if, if you dive long enough, you have lots of them. Uh, close calls and near misses and could have learned from that type thing. I try to weave those throughout uh, an entire class. So I always try, I'm looking to attach the why. Why did something happen? Why Why is this important? Why should we do this, this or that? And then I say, well, you know, this is what happened to me one time. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that, that we make is assuming that our students need to think that we're perfect. And the reality is, you know, we're not, we know we're not, um, and, and students know we're not perfect as well. So if we don't, if we don't um, uh, show them that, yeah, we're human and we make mistakes and it's okay to make mistakes, if we, we miss a real critical opportunity to connect with our students and also to establish credibility, because if the students know that everybody makes mistakes, then why are we trying so hard to, to hide the fact that we make errors? I think it goes a long way to creating a, a connectedness between our students when we share our own mistakes in our past and how we learn from different things. And that that can take a little bit of a, a mental strength on our part because, you know, we, we want to be thought of as the experts and, well, darn it, experts don't make mistakes. But, you know, we all know that that's not true. It, history is... Um, uh, you know, replete with examples of, of experts making mistakes. So I, I, I embrace it. I embrace the fact that I regularly make errors and mistakes and how I learn from this. And, and um, I share those with my students and, it, and it, it goes a long way, I think, to building a bond between your uh, students and yourself. I try to, uh, rather than when we hear about a mistake or uh, or an accident or something, I try to explain to uh, students about you know how it made sense at the time for that person to make that mistake, and talk about the, the why, not about the what. Nobody really sets out to make a mistake to start with, and we're all trying to do our best. 
so if we can if we can try to get people to understand the why we go much further than if we just try to assign blame i had an interesting conversation uh, not too long ago with someone uh, who's fairly uh, fairly close to me and they were talking about an aviation accident that happened and they and they said well you know uh, this guy basically it was pilot error well i'm pretty sure that the pilot in the morning when he got up he, he didn't plan on what he did and he had thousands and thousands of hours of experience and um, he was faced with um, a kind of a, a decision-making process with limited um, information and uh, he made the wrong he made the he made a choice that to him at that time seemed like the one that made sense and and unfortunately um, it didn't work out but if we understand that that you know how how could he make that decision? You know, was he tired? Was the uh, what, what was going on in the environment? Uh, all sorts of things that can affect uh, his ability to make that decision. And now we're not looking at assigning blame. We're trying to understand that, and that's the useful tool that you can pay forward to the next group of, in this case, pilots. Or, you know, I don't have to uh, go too far to use diving analogy for something like this as well. You know, why did the divers uh, make the decisions they did? Well, there's all sorts of reasons, and probably none of them were because um, they planned to fail. So the only part that there's any learning there is when we can understand how they made the decisions and how, how their decision-making process was affected. And to me, that's the whole goal of, of uh, teaching technical divers is to get them to make decisions and to understand what things are affecting their decision-making. If you just focus on the outcomes, uh, the analogy I'll use is like um, you try to understand how a cake was made just by tasting it. You really don't know what the recipe was or how they made the cake. You just said, well, that's a good cake or that's a cake I don't like to eat. Um, but if you want to repeat that same recipe, well, you really need to understand all the decisions that made uh, that went into making that, that uh, cake. So when the students arrive at, at um, uh, technical courses and they're expecting just to focus on things like gas switches, etc. One of the first things I do is start every class with actually before I uh, just after introductions and as I I start to explain to them this concept of um, uh, safety, the uh, fail safely uh, by Todd Conklin, and I try to use um, you know that we put barriers and and defenses in place leading up to incidents, but that we can never make that um, possibility of having that incident zero. So then we, we need to look at the other side. What do we have in place so that if there is an incident or an accident, how do we fail safely? And that's just about as important as the first side, which is the defenses and barriers. And I'll use, uh, I'll start out with, with using an example of, um, uh, of driving and uh, you know how we have speed limits and we have rules of the road and we have driver training, et cetera, et cetera. But then we still have seat belts and airbags and EMS and, and uh, life flight, et cetera, et cetera. None of that stuff would be necessary if we never had accidents, except that we know we have accidents. And so we need to also look at the fail safely side. And then I'll just tie this, I'll use diving, uh, a diving example where we have all sorts of things leading to protect us from adverse events. Say we're talking about high uh, PO2s and uh, you know switching to the wrong gas at the wrong depth. We'd have protocol for that. We have cylinder marking. We have gas analyzing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then we also have on the fail safely side, we have the what if something goes wrong. So how do we protect um, the individual if they uh, if the adverse event still happens? And here is where there, we can use something like the, you know, the affectionately named the Swiss cheese model. And I'm sure uh, many people are familiar with this, but basically what is happening is you have multiple barriers or layers, defenses, etc. cetera, um, but they're all moving and they all have flaws in them. And it's just a matter of time before uh, all these parts and pieces happen to move enough that they line up and then you have a adverse event. Um, and the fewer pieces, uh, the fewer barriers that you remove, um, whether it's through uh, forgetting to do 
a gas analysis, or maybe it's the, the blender made a mistake. Uh, you know, he's the first piece of the Swiss cheese, and and then the blender. Uh, so you remove that barrier. Then the analyzer makes a mistake. You remove that barrier. Then we have a uh, on the gas switch. Maybe there's no uh, awareness of the depth that happens. You remove that barrier. So we, you start to get pretty close to to having the accident. And if you if you can explain uh, to students that this is something that happens and can happen in, in pretty much uh, every aspect of diving, I always keep coming back to it and coming back to it and coming back to it. And say, hey, you know, you just moved a layer of Swiss cheese from your from your um, uh, from your safety. Problem is that one is a little bit simplistic because it's a very linear approach and it doesn't account for unexpected things. Um, and this is uh, this is a, a model, I believe, uh, Gareth. I believe you made this one. But what it is 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 we don't really know uh, all the we don't have all the knowledge about all the emergent properties that could happen, things that we didn't expect. And it's just a question of time where we have a, a critical mass that could be where you uh, just have too many things overwhelming the diver and. These are good things, I think, to get the student thinking about uh, something as simple as you know, you miss a, a piece of gear and equipment check and how it could affect you later on, or you don't tuck your light cord away before you do a gas switch. How what how could that affect you? Well, if they don't if they don't know because they're not um, aware of the, the what the future is going to hold, then um, they won't even think about it, that it could be important. So I think it's our job to to. Th to help them look into the future a little bit so that they can understand some of this. If you talk about uh, models of causality and, and uh, incidents, uh, accidents, things like that, it'll make your debriefs a lot easier because you'll have a common theme that you can refer back to. You've got to go back to it consistently, consistently. And the students will start to debrief themselves because you've given them a tool uh, that they can employ in their own debriefs. And that's where the magic really happens because now you're teaching them to, to fish and you haven't just bought them a fish. I like to use the uh, the Roomba model of learning a lot. And and uh, anybody who's listening to this, if you're one of my students, you'll get it. But, you know, the Roomba is this robot vacuum cleaner thing that bumps into everything in your house um, on the floor. And what's left over is the vacuumable space. And so the Roomba, is, it makes mistakes all the time and whatever is is not the mistake is is the good thing right well we're kind of like Roombas we learn by making mistakes we bump into everything in a room and then um, you know hopefully we, we don't make the same mistake because our algorithm and our brain says okay well last time you picked up that hot uh, plate you burned your hands so don't do that again the, the advantage is here though is that we're we're kind of like smart Roombas in the sense that we don't necessarily have to do everything wrong ourselves and we can learn from uh, from another Roomba. So if these Roombas could talk, they could probably uh, uh, they could probably share information and then the new Roomba wouldn't have to do make all the same mistakes that the old Roomba made if he was upgraded into a room. And, and humans uh, learn the same way. We can watch someone make a mistake in a technical diving course and uh, you talk about what the error was and how they made it. And you know what were they thinking at the time to you know to you know how how that happened, and the other students are listening, and um, you know they learn from it, and then you move on. It saves a lot of time, that's for sure. I so I thread the Swiss cheese model through all of my training, and I always ask them to look into the future, and and um, we talk about the uh, the what ifs all the time, and and then I try to ask for personal stories and try to get them involved in in um, uh, thinking about their past experience diving experience and wherever any of these any of these uh, uh, they can look and say oh yeah I remember this and, and uh, this this makes sense uh, based on you know looking at it from a different perspective now all right so I told you I was going to come back to this because I thought it was really important and I think really you know a successful dive consists of a hundred a thousand decisions and you don't even know um, a lot of the decisions that you've made because you you don't recognize them as as overt decisions, but you're consistently and constantly making decisions. And 
how those decisions are made is just as important. Uh, it, it, let me rephrase that. Uh, the, the things that go into making your decisions and, and the influence your decision making is just as important as the decision itself, because we need to understand what influences are, are um, affecting our decision making. So we're going to just kind of work through these uh, one at a time and um, give you a couple of examples of each and how they can apply. All right. Well, the first one, obviously, is from the teamwork perspective, there is uh, all my dive training is all about uh, teams. I, I don't train individuals. It's always a, a team of at least two, usually three people. And there is just no end of opportunity to um, work on good teamwork skills. My whole life has been a uh, inclusion in teams, whether it was for the military to career with rugby to uh, everything. So it's for me, I, I, I can't understand. Uh, I, I, my brain is totally wrapped around the teamwork. In the classroom, on the land, in the water, it doesn't matter. There's just endless opportunities uh, for developing teamwork. And it's important that good teamwork starts from the bottom and works its way to the top. And then you need some guidance from the top. And that would be you as the instructor. And then later on, as um, the team leader will be doing, they'll be guiding the rest of the team. But it, but it has to, the communication has to come from the bottom upwards in order to start developing a team. You can start by analyzing the gas as a team in the morning, uh, carrying equipment down to the beach or to the boat as a team, have lunch as a team, travel to the dive site as a team. Um, a lot of times, um, some it can be a little bit logistically challenging, but I always try to get the students to drive together to wherever the dive site is, if it's a half hour or an hour away. But I, I emphasize teamwork right from the get-go, right? And even when you would never even think it's about teams, it is. And even if they're traveling someplace together and staying someplace, if they can stay in the same accommodation, generally speaking, and, and um, uh, socialize afterwards together, you're building teamwork. Um, a, a trick I learned a long time ago, too, is that sometimes you get doing some um, kind of challenging math exercises. And it's great if you give, say, here's some examples. I'd like you to work through them and just leave the room and let, the, uh, let them solve the problems together as a team. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to watch what happens because the, the observer effect that we have when we watch the whole thing, uh, it, it's very, very different if, if we're not present and um, they'll work together and then they'll make notes together and you'll hear them that later on refer back to each other and, and it's uh, pretty cool to watch. Ultimately, you know, building a team, it's all about building trust. And I mean, you can use several examples during a dive. You know, there's the gas switch for us is um, uh, requires a teammate verification. And there's, uh, you know, you're trusting your teammate as your buoyancy reference so that you don't always have to do that. Whether we're, if we're doing valve failure resolution uh, in technical classes, uh, you know, the, you can't see what the teammate is doing behind your head. So you have to trust that they're doing the right thing. And I think it's really important to note that, that you know, you can train pretty much anybody with enough repetitions to do any of the technical skills. But trust you have to earn. Trust is something that will only come through time and uh, by building up enough experience, shared experience together, uh, that, that it's, it's something that emerges from, from that. You just don't have automatic trust. And I can think to one of the courses I had where I actually failed a student um, and it was all about trust. He, um, uh, one of the other students that said, hey, I, I, he's not there when I'm doing a gas switch. I can't even watch. Uh, I, I look up and he's not paying attention to me. And, uh, you know, so I, I don't know, um, you know, where his head's at. And I don't trust that he's there to help me when I, when I need it. And it turned out that the other fellow had been practicing uh, by himself. And so I had this conversation with him. I said, hey, look, you know, um, this is about teamwork. And you, you, first off, you need to stop just going out and diving by yourself and practicing this because that's just not what we do or what we are about. And uh, second thing is you're, you're learning all the bad things and reinforcing them in the sense that you're totally inside yourself when you're doing this gas switch, you're not allowing the team in. And moreover, when you do uh, the gas switch practice with the teammate, they're not, you're not there for them because you haven't learned for them to be there for you. And um, 
he he did it one more time and and i said okay well you know we're i'm ceasing your training and he was pretty surprised he couldn't figure that out but um you know i think one of the biggest parts of communication i learned in that was the teammate the other teammate felt that uh, there was no trust there from from uh, from this individual. Leadership is obviously very important, and and for me, um, a class is just as important as you're building leaders as you are building um, uh, followers. I rotate the the leadership roles in the team regularly, um, and what I what I'll do is, is unlike uh, some of the. You know, earlier classes that were senior classes, I'll brief the, the leader will be present, all the students will be present, and I'll, I'll brief the leader on the dive and then say, okay, so now you in turn tell the team what it is that you want them to do. So that starts the process of, of communication with building leaders and the followers looking towards that leader and they all get a chance to do that. Then underwater, when I need to communicate something about we're going to go somewhere or do something, I'll communicate to the leader, and then the leader will then in turn communicate to the rest of the team. So that works out really well, and it um, uh, helps develop leadership. And I think it's important that we all understand that we are a role model in everything we do, whether it's showing up on time, whether it's how our equipment looks, whether every single thing we're being watched in a class. And it's really important that you that's your opportunity as a leader to set the tone for what you want them to do. And that old saying about do as I say, not as I do, just doesn't fly in a class where you have, um, you know, pretty switched on individuals by the time they get into the more senior and advanced training classes. And, and they'll copy you in ways that you never even anticipated. You you may have a little habit that you do, just the way you clip a you know a double under or a bolt snap off or something, and it's totally a you thing, and you won't even know it. And it's just like a habit that you have. Pretty soon you'll watch the whole team do something like that. Uh, someone told me a funny story about about just the way they put their gloves on, and pretty soon they started to watch. It's like, why do you guys all do that same way? It's like, well, we watched, and that's how you do it. It's like. Yeah, but it doesn't matter if you put your right glove on or your left glove on first. It doesn't really matter. So anyways, that was kind of funny. Communication, obviously very important. You can start right with a very clear, concise briefings and then also debriefings uh, to the point and uh, clear uh, when you set your, uh, set your stage for um, when you're doing the briefings and uh, debriefings, especially in the water, you may not be what's uh, aware of what's behind you but uh, i remember having my back to the uh, to the beach and uh, everyone i i saw they were kind of distracted until i looked around and there's a whole bunch of people that were came down to the beach with umbrellas and started to suntan and everything so that everyone all the students were a little bit distracted so the next time we came up we all switched switched uh, positions so that they they could be distracted um, hand signals, I think, are very important that you establish how you want them done and uh, that they're nice and clear and there's no shorthand done with hand signals. A lot of people get in the habit of, uh, of taking shortcuts when it comes to good hand signals. And also, remember, there's no one-size-fits-all uh, with student communication. Um, and it's a mistake just to repeat the same thing over and over and over again if, uh, if someone's not hearing you, or even worse, just to say it louder. It doesn't, that doesn't work. So find the way that, that uh, communicates best with the different students. I think this is the most uh, single most important skill that a good technical diver can have and one that, that we need to really, really focus on to teach. And it's all about the understanding what it is um, and integrating that into what it means and then the projection forward about what something is actually, uh, what, what what it implies for the future and i try to bring this into every dive debrief you know like your situational awareness or your uh, your awareness your bubble of awareness i try to consistently reinforce this because it, it's interesting if you teach enough you'll see that students will they'll observe something um but they don't seem to process it and then they don't understand what it can mean as they go forward watching students swim down uh, uh, drop down a line onto a wreck and watching a line unspool from the reel or out of their pocket from a spool and um, you can see the teammate turns over and looks at it and 
and clearly they see it because they're staring right at it. It might even illuminate with their light, and then they don't do anything about it. And of course, then that comes back to bite them in some place. Maybe, maybe I helped that along, but the the it's really interesting to watch that they haven't actually projected that into the future. So I spend a lot of time on this, and don't be surprised that the average person who's really really smart loses a lot of mental capacity underwater. And I, I try to give them examples of, all, of this all the time. And, and you know, by day two in a class, you can use the class examples. That, that will happen for sure. The, I, I use an analogy to explain how you uh, talk about situational awareness in water. And it's, if you go to a gym and you sit at a, um, uh, what we used to call the universal gym. I don't know if they're around anymore, but it's like a, a machine where you can apply all the energy. If you're going to do a bench press, you can apply all the energy on the bars and they're in a track. And so there's nowhere for this thing to go except up. And you don't have to be really great on form or anything. And, and it's just a question of pushing the, pushing the bar in the track, right? Now, the problem is if you give them a set of dumbbells, all of a sudden now they can't do that because they have to stabilize the weight as well as they're lifting it. And they have to use all these little, you know, I've heard them called helper muscles for stability muscles. And you'll find pretty soon that they can't lift as much weight as they did before because they have to focus on stabilizing the weight at the same time as they're trying to lift it. So I try to get them, get my students to understand that that these helper muscles and stabilizing muscles are just as important as the actual big muscle because you you can teach anyone uh, mechanical skills, but it's really really hard to teach things like awareness of where I am and how deep am I, where's the upline, upline, what is the condition of my equipment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that's super super important. Then. Affecting this whole decision making matrix is try to remember back to when you were a student. Remember how tired you were after a class. Remember, what, uh, for me in Pacific Northwest, remember what the cold was like and how it, it decreased your uh, performance capacity. Uh, you were tired, you're physically tired. So make sure that you give them enough time for lunch and for, uh, uh, you know, bio breaks. And I always finish my classes by 6 p.m. unless there's some unforeseen act of God that makes us go a little bit later. But I, you know, the, the days of running classes like boot camp, nine to ten o'clock at night or something, that's totally, um, you know, there's no value to that at all. Your students' brains shut off uh, about <laughs> four hours before that, and they need time to recuperate and reset the clock for the next day. At the by day six, after a six-day course, everybody's pretty exhausted. And it's not just a question of the physical side of things; it's the fact that their brain has been working so hard, as well as physical part. And then when you throw in the cold and etc., for us, it's it's a whole different ballgame. So make sure that they get lots of time to rest and recharge their batteries. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention uh, towards the end of my presentation here is the concept of the authority gradient. And this is just a perceived difference in status between different members of an organization. This is something that is present in every instructor-student relationship and every class that you've ever taught or been a part of, even if you didn't think it was. And the reason you may not have thought it was is the instructors because, well, you're the instructor and you're at the top of that authority gradient. But it is absolutely critical that you are aware of this. Students will look to you as the authority uh, subject and they won't challenge you when a lot of times you should be challenged. So I think it's really important that we try to build a very low authority gradient um, at particular times in the class. And there's, certainly there's times where you want to have the authority presence, um, but when you are teaching your fellow teammates, and your fellow divers for the future, treat them with respect and understand that this is a collaborative learning opportunity where they can learn from you and it's not just a top-down teaching type approach. Remember what it was like for you. Think back to some of your best instructors um, and uh, how that went for you. So I, I would encourage you to, to look at uh, with high-performing teams when you're building high-performing teams, look at creating a low authority gradient. Then we're going to talk about how to do debriefs. And I'm just going to go through a, a model that uh, Gareth came up with. 
And um, this is a, a great structure and it helps students who are not used to doing debriefs, helps them get through it to start with. So uh, it's an, uh, a mnemonic, an acronym, and it's easy to remember. Uh, so define is the first part. How long is the debrief going to take to find what the goals of the debrief um, uh, will be and what were the goals and objectives of the dive? Make sure you stay focused. Try to do it in a sentence or two, because if you have, a, if you make sure that there is a, uh, if you have a goal, then, then you know you can evaluate your performance against that goal. And otherwise, if you don't have it, you don't know if you actually achieved it or not. The example uh, is important and it's your opportunity to set the, create psychological safety and set the bar. Say as an instructor, uh, you know, it's like, well, hey, you know, I'm, I, um, I was watching this and I made a mistake uh, because, you know, I should have done this um, and uh, I didn't. And, you know, so it impaired my ability to do this or such. And, and, and give it an explanation of, of, uh, of why it happened. So use some storytelling. And that sets the tone for um, when you're going to get them to start debriefing themselves. And then there's the basic part of the debrief, which is the administration. You know, how is the timing? Did would everyone understand the plan? What was the plan? Did uh, did we get done what we tried to do? It's great to go through. Uh, there's different ways to to uh, review the execution of the dive chronologically. It's usually pretty simple. Everybody understands that. But don't get too far into the weeds on this one. Focus on the key the key factors and the key points. Then here's the opportunity for everyone to uh, one thing they did well, uh, one thing they need to improve on, and how will they improve it? And you'll be surprised that um, uh, frequently it's hard to get someone to say something they did well. It's it's more uh, more common that they'll start out with, ah, I should have done this or I didn't do this. It's like, whoa, whoa, back up. What did you think you did well? Well, you know, I didn't do this. It's like, whoa, 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 hang on. We need, we're trying to, we're trying to understand the things you did well so that we can repeat them, not just identify the things you didn't do well so we can avoid them. Then, uh, and then we need to look at the whole team. One thing the team did well and why one thing the team needs to improve on and how the team uh, do that and be specific. So it's something that you can, that's measurable so that you can check it against the next time. And finally, the follow-up there, you know, there could be a report that has to be written. Um, you can share the debrief with others so that they can learn from it. And this is your opportunity to create a just culture because if you've done the first part of the debrief correctly, then there, there's uh, not a lot of finger pointing and there's a lot of understanding and, and this is um, uh, really useful. Questions I always ask is, you know, what did we learn? What went well and why? What could we improve? And you'll notice that none of those questions say the things that we did wrong. I mean, it's like, what do we, it, those are generated by the, what we did well and how could we improve? Um, but uh, it creates a, a, a totally different mindset when you're looking at the things you did well and how you can um, improve other things. Uh, I remember being told uh, one time, uh, in summary of your, for uh, debriefing someone, it's uh, things you did well, things that could use improvement, and how to fix them. And uh, that stuck with me. Now, I would like to finish this with just giving you some uh, uh, personal anecdotes, personal advice, things that have happened for me that, that work really well after a class. And if you have a community or you have a series of classes you're teaching, and it's, it's really great if you can start a community of, of uh, fellow divers where you can just have an uh, adjust culture where you can discuss and talk about uh, different things and different incidents. And consider this like that whole debrief model, but on a bigger scale of, of um, a lot of the uh, divers that have been in your classes, et cetera. You know, this is a place for learning from other people. This is a place for the Roombas to exchange, exchange knowledge and it allows for context-rich storytelling. And, and you need to go into the detail about all the incidents because we're trying to understand what happened. And, uh, we're sorry, we're trying to understand the why about, about what happened, not just the what happened, because that's where the learning takes place. And uh, so we have a group in the Pacific Northwest here where we all actually share these types of stories and Gareth's part of it, which is really great because we bring a, um, you know, another perspective into, into talking about this. And, and it's a very mature, very adult conversation, and we learn a lot from it. 
and uh, I'd encourage you to do something like that in your in your communities because it's um, you know it's it's just a, a great way to um, build safety in, into your into your diving community. All right, well, thank you very much. That's uh, my time is up, and I hope uh, everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. And I look forward to uh, presenting this live. But if uh, if the Wi-Fi wasn't uh, up to speed, well, you still got to see it. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Garrett, you're muted. So that, uh, thank you, Guy, even though I'm just talking to a screen. Um, I really t in, in, uh, enjoyed that talk. And it's one of the, the constant things that I get asked when, when people come to classes is like, okay, I've learned something. Now, what do, do I do with it? Um, and so Guy's given some, some great examples. Um, now, we'd asked some people to, to send sort of questions in, and I've got a couple here. That, that I know that we're going to be uh, presented to Guy, and, and I'll try and answer them. One of them was about, you know, how do you express the importance of teaching situation awareness to divers? And, and I have the same challenge when I teach the classes that I do. Situation awareness is incredibly difficult to teach because the models are created in other people's heads. It's like trying to teach, you know, from a dive instructor, trying to teach somebody how to be trim, flat trim in the water, because the muscles and the responses are felt by them. So the way that I, I, I get that concept across about teaching uh, situational awareness is asking people as we're going through simulations and tools, things like, is you can almost stop the game and then you say, what's going to happen next? Um, uh, or, or what do you think is happening now? Uh, and, and this sort of look of horror on their face because they don't understand it. Now, obviously underwater, you're a, bit, a little bit limited in terms of what's going on but as an instructor you know you could talk about this stuff on on the surface and then you can get wet notes out and say okay where's the wreck where's the upline how long have we got into you know how long have we spent in terms of diving this so it's all about getting people to think about what they're doing um, and and as they get more skilled at uh, monitoring what's going on and then assessing what's going on next then it becomes a little bit more subconscious and, and second nature. And the other bit is um, relating to the debrief model that, that I created and, and has been quite successful in getting out there is the need to focus on the why things went well and how do we improve. The observations of things that went well is, is relatively easy. The harder bit is understanding why, say, team communications worked well. Um, why that decision was a sound one. That, you know, focusing on the good stuff and then looking at the deeper pieces. Then when it comes to improving, and as Guy highlighted, you know, people can observe, well, I didn't do that well, and so-and-so, and it's this bit, okay, so how are you going to improve it? Well, I'm going to pay more attention. Well, no, you can't pay more attention because it's a limited capacity. Or we're going to communicate more clearly. Okay, how are you going to communicate more clearly? So really focus on, on the why and the how. And um, one of the, the best ways of trying to create a psychologically safe environment is get people to write some ideas down. Um, it's a little bit difficult post-dive, but if you're going to clean up after a dive and then have a, a, a post-dive debrief when all the kit's put away, then actually you can use something called think, write, and share. So think about the answers to the questions, write them down, and then you can share them. And that way, everybody's got a voice and you can make sure that the stuff is captured. So um, I'm going to wrap up this one. I'm going to I can go into the lobby uh, and, and be there for, for talks uh, in the uh, meet the last speaker from Hall One and see if I can answer any questions on that. Um, and then at the top of the hour, we've got uh, David Cannon and uh, he's going to talk about what can le what can happen legally after an incident. So that's the top of the hour. You've got 16 minutes, uh, and that is the final presentation of the day. And uh, I'll let uh, Anders do the intro and the closure down. So thank you very much for, for listening to that. I'll be in the lobby now.